Hello there. Good evening. Welcome to the Library of Mythical Ireland. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Live Irish Myths, episode number 185. Tonight we are returning to Sylvester O'Halloran's History of Ireland. Hope you can join us for the next hour or hour and a half, wherever you are in the world. And if you're joining us, we are streaming live on the Mythical Ireland Facebook page and also on the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel. Please do feel free to say hello we like to say hello back. Hope that everybody's having a great Monday, whether it's the morning, the afternoon, the evening or the night, and that you're all in good form. Uh, we're on a public holiday today. This is the June bank holiday weekend in Ireland. So no work today. Not in the office anyway. Different kind of work today. Some work in the garden. And as a consequence of which, I'm quite exhausted. Uh, Julie M is the first to comment tonight. Julie is in Wisconsin and is saying hello. Slauncha, Julie, welcome to Live Irish Myths. Uh, Alan Hoskins saying hello, Anthony. Hello, everyone. Hope you're, hope you're well. Yes, indeed, Alan. All good. Great to see you again. Sandra Boothroyd. Trinona Sandra Falcha. Adrian O'Beglin is saying evening, Anthony and all. Hello, Adrian. Welcome along. Who Gadarn? says well hello well hello indeed julie m i'm just beginning the summer break and i'm quilting and listening to irish myths that sounds idyllic actually julie uh yeah perfect you know and uh i'm uh just sitting here saying hello to everyone and waiting to get started um that's all so far mandy mccurl is in the house Mandy tells us it's a beautiful evening on the Isle of Mull. Mandy, of course, one of those who met us on the Hill of Tara for our gathering on the 22nd of May. Uh, information about the next gathering of the Tua is scrolling along the bottom of the screen. On the ticker, uh, Saturday, the 9th of July, 11 a.m., Hill of Ishnock. Hope to see you all there. Uh, but Nicolene is saying good evening. Hello, uh, Nicolene. I'm not sure if we have seen you before. You're very welcome, and I hope you enjoy the live stream. Brendan Byrne is in Glendalock. I hope it's a nice day down there, Brendan, as nice as it is here in the Wee County. Indira Stefaniana says good evening. Hello to you, Indira. Uh, very nice of you to join us again. Britt Griffin is glad to be back. Missed a few episodes here in Northern Ontario. The lilacs are finally in bloom. Brilliant stuff. And of course, we are racing towards midsummer now, 15 days away, just over two weeks. And then the year turns and the days start getting short. No, we're not even going to start talking about that because that will only depress me. Sean Potter says, amazing weather today. Hope you're well. all in good form, uh, Sean. Hope you're in good form too. Hugadarn is in the Isle of Wight. Brilliant stuff. Hope it's a nice day down there. Uh, Karen Murphy Beglin. No, that's not the right one. That one says hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Jigwich, Karen, uh, Falcha. Daisy Peters, who is watching in Rio, uh, is saying a very pleasant evening to you all. Hope it's a nice day down, way down there, uh, Daisy, across the ocean. Ah, I was wondering. Karen Murphy Beglin and Adrian O'Beglin, I suspect, I don't know what makes me think it, but I suspect they may be uh, cohabiting, <laughs> watching in different rooms, are we? <laughs> uh, brilliant. Is it Jana or Yana Carver on my lunch break in the USA? Thanks for keeping me company. Very happy to do that. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Marsha Downs. You were doing so many wonderful gatherings tours. I wish I was there. Would definitely join in them. Yeah, and uh, look, sister, it's a great pleasure. We're, at least we're able to do it now following the uh, the pandemic and all of those closures and the fact that we could never do anything like that. It's great to be able to actually meet uh, in person now. Uh, Anne McCallum, can't visit with you today. Just popped in to say hello, but I'll enjoy part two and all the crack later tonight. That's no problem, Anne. Thanks for saying hello anyway. A uh, very good day to you. Hope life in Ontario is treating you well. And we'll see you on the rerun, as they say, later on. Uh, Nora Gaffney O'Connor is in the house. Hello, Nora. Good evening to you. Mandy McCurl is saying hello to others. John Main 
uh, gr greets us from Bell Mullet on an overcast evening. Well, all I can say, John, is please you keep those clouds over there because it's nice and bright here in the Boyne Valley. In fact, if I open the window, you'll probably see. There you go. Look at that. <laughs> you, you just don't get that. Uh, this is the only time of year that happens. A few weeks either side of midsummer where the sun comes around to the back of the house far enough in the morning and the evening to shine directly in the window. Look at that. That's super. So there you are. Um, John, I hope you're in good form. Karen Faye O'Loughlin is in Boulder, Colorado. Stunning weather this week. Fantastic stuff, Karen. Adrian says, same room with the wife, but different devices, so you can send different comments. I can understand that. Calvin Clown, <laughs> I love the handle, is in Leitrim. Good evening to all our friends in Leitrim and the Northwest. Wayne Bird is saying hello evening. Wayne, hope you're keeping well. Great to see you. Brendan says, after two days of rain, the sun had broken through. Thanks to Mythical Ireland. Always makes me smile. <laughs> Don't think I have that kind of authority to to cause the clouds to part. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't take that kind of credit. <laughs> but anyway, it sounds lovely. Irish technical thinker, who is Marcus. I presume, Marcus, you are watching from your usual haunt of Belfast. A very good evening to all our friends in the north. Helen Hirschchatter says, Hi, Tante and all the two are from Black Hills of South Dakota. Wow. Must be a beautiful part of the world, Helen. I've never been, but you never know. Maybe someday as part of that whirlwind tour of the States, I'll get to go there. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter is in the house. Hello, Elaine. And uh, uh, Elaine says hello to everybody. Nora Gaffney O'Connor uh, is saying, Gia Yiv Galair. How is she caught in Anthony? Are you sucking days of a great week in the waves? Well, I'm glad to hear that it's been nice out at sea. I uh, know, I tell you, at the price of diesel these days, I wouldn't be sucking it. I uh, I think whiskey is cheaper. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Uh, Joe Butler is saying hello from beautiful Colorado. I shared the live stream to the Mythical Ireland community and creatives pages. Brilliant stuff. I'll have, I'll have to take the punishment and scolding because I must leave class early. I will catch up on YouTube later. Well, Joe, you'll be delighted to know you're not the only one, so that's perfectly fine. Thank you for the shares. Appreciate it, as always. And I'm already falling asleep after an exhausting weekend. Oh, somebody else can read the story tonight. <laughs> Rex Fortenberry. Banachty Tua August Anton. Oh, Louisiana. Hello, Rex. A very good afternoon to our friends in Louisiana from the Wee County and from the Boyne Valley here on the east coast of Ireland. Stephen O'Hara, greetings from a pleasant evening in Kilkenny. Hello, Stephen. Great to see you. Katie Brogan is glad to be here in Earth space. Are you in Earth or in space? Which one is it? <laughs> Make up your mind. No, I joke. Sean Harding says, evening. Uh, Sean, welcome to the live stream. Deborah Williams says, hello. To everyone on this beautiful June afternoon, I hope you're doing well. Doing great. And I hope everyone else is in the same boat. Elaine Dink Dent Lingenfelter says, I'll trade cloudy over 100 Fahrenheit, which is 38 Celsius. Ooh, wow. Burning up. Tom King is in the house. Hello there, Anthony, and all the mighty to a beautiful sunset here at the Boyne Valley and working away. Looking forward, as always, to story time. Brilliant stuff, Tom. Keep her lit. Busy man, busy man. Janet Moran is saying hi from Boston. A very good afternoon to all our friends in Boston, uh, a part of the world where there are a lot of Irish people. Uh, Cheryl Ann McFetridge is also in Boston, uh, sunny Boston. Brilliant stuff. Joan, I don't know how to pronounce that. Is it Crag or Cra Crag? Crag. I apologize. Joan, despite my terrible mispronunciations, you are very welcome. And hello to all our friends in Denmark on this beautiful summer evening as we, as I say, uh, approach midsummer. Sarah Murray Anderson is in Ennismore, Ontario. Hope one day I can make it to one of your walks. Bucket list. You'd be more than welcome, Sarah. And we look forward to the day when you're able to do that. Adina Sparks is in the house. Monday's story time. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Josie Weatherford. Uh, Josie, I met again uh, on Saturday. Uh, Josie was one of the two uh, who was able to come to the Hill of Tara on the 22nd of May. And uh, great to see you in Drogheda on Saturday, Josie. 
oh, I'm terribly sorry. This is going to be a problem tonight. I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay awake. I, this story better be interesting. That's all I can say. I better be able to keep myself awake. And Scott Doherty is saying, fault you from the west of Ireland. Sitting here with a, a charcuterie board and a glass of Chardonnay. Life is good. It certainly is. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'd nearly drive down there and do the live stream from there if there was a glass of Chardonnay on offer. <laughs> Erica Humberducey in Ipswich is saying it's cold and cloudy in Suffolk. Sorry, we can't help you with that, uh, Erica. It's uh, sunny. That's a decent evening. It's been a nice day in the Boyne Valley. And I am just seriously struggling. Very tired. Anyway, that's what happens. Who are uh, Who have I not said hello? Lots of conversation happening, which is absolutely lovely. As always. Uh, Patricia Pack. Yay, I made it. Hi, everyone from Virginia Beach. Good evening, good afternoon, Patricia. And welcome to Live Irish Myths. Barbara Murphy is saying hello to all her favorite to uh, from a warm, sunny Tucson. Well, send some of that to some of the cloudy, cold people, uh, Barbara, and you will be a heroine to many. Sue Prenter, great excuse to leave the weeding and put the feet up. Well, I was doing a bit of gardening today. Not a whole lot now. A bit of mowing and a bit of strimming. And uh, sure, look, I'm just fit for the old bed now at this stage. I'll be honest, you know. <laughs> Nora Kafnik O'Connor is talking about the bat cave. <laughs> Snapper Earl says, 81 degrees and sunny in the Hudson Valley. Brilliant stuff. Sounds nice. Fiona Newman is saying hello from Canada. Hello, Fiona. A very good afternoon to you. Hope life is well in Canada. Cy B is in bed, relaxing in County Limerick. Miserable weather here. This is really odd. It's, it's been the most beautiful day. Well, especially in the afternoon. Oh, I see on the rainfall radar, there's rain over Clare and Limerick. So, yeah, not much we can do about that. But your luck, hopefully it won't last long, you know. Uh, who else? Um, Paula, is it Kivlahan? Hey guys, just back from Dundry Park, Dunderry Park. Beautiful festival up there the weekend. Brilliant stuff. Hope that was uh, a, a nice event, Paula. Lots of uh, happy, smiley people. And I believe it or not, we seem to have caught up because a lot of conversation going on between the two, which is to say is just fabulous, you know. A special mention to our uh, long, long time friend and follower, Joan McHugh. Uh, you may have seen my post about that, uh, that Joan's mother uh, passed away unexpectedly over the past couple of days. And uh, Joan uh, hasn't been on the live streams for the last few weeks and uh, is understandably um, probably going to take some time off from the live streams now. Uh, and uh, we want to extend our uh, deepest sympathies to Joan and her family on their sad bereavement and wish you all the very best at this time sending lots of love and hugs and kisses and prayers and thoughts and thank you to everybody who uh, did all of that and lit candles uh, for Joan um yes so before we start the story sure look there's always something going on at mythical Ireland don't you know I have, not that it hasn't already been revealed, but I do have a very, very nice uh, uh, revelation, a very nice creation to show you. I wonder if you could guess where it was created, <laughs> right here in the Boyne Valley. This is uh, the first, and as of this moment in time, the only Newgrange Curbstone 67 pendant created by the wonderfully gifted hands of our friend uh, and longtime viewer Tom King on Gobba based right here in the Boyne Valley look at that for a beautiful piece of work what do you think of that isn't that a stunner isn't it the uh, conjoined spirals and the lozenges above and below this very familiar emblem from or set of emblems from Curbstone 67 at Newgrange not found, I believe, in that configuration anywhere else. A very unique uh, design. 
So I'll just zoom in on that slightly and uh, preferably hide my face so that you can get a, a better look at it and look at the uh, craftsmanship on that. Isn't it beautiful? A fabulous piece of work. I think you'll agree. That is the Curbstone 67 pendant by our own Tom King on Goba. Now, uh, yes, indeed, some people are already saying I want one. Well, uh, don't don't go anywhere yet. Uh, so the announcement is this, that uh, this uh, item is uh, being offered as a prize for one of our semi-regular Mythical Ireland raffles in association with uh, Live Irish Myths. Uh, this is a wearable item, by the way. Hang on till I just uh, momentarily take off my uh, triple spiral pendant. Triscal Pendant. Uh, these are available right now on mythicalireland.com. You can buy your own Triple Spiral or Triscal Pendant. So this is a wearable pendant. And uh, yeah, look at that. Isn't it fabulous? So uh, this item is valued at 200 euros. This one is going to be a prize in a draw. All you need to do uh, to be in with a chance of winning Tom's wonderful uh, Newgrange Curbstone 67 Pendant is to buy any item uh, on the Mythical Ireland website, whether it be an Ongoba creation, one of Tom's pendants, or his mythical letter opener, his uh, large Triscal, or any of my books. So anybody who buys anything on the website uh, will automatically be entered into the draw. When will the draw take place? Ha 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 Yes, indeed. So the draw will take place at the gathering of the Mythical Ireland Tua on the Hill of Ishnach on the 9th of July. Now, rest assured, you do not have to attend uh, the Hill of Ishnach walking tour uh, to be in with a chance of winning the pendant. All you need to do is to order an item from the Mythical Ireland website. And anybody who does so between right now at this moment in time and the 9th of July, well, probably we will close it on uh, the evening uh, of Friday the 10th at midnight uh, because I know I will be on the road very early on that morning on the 11th uh, sorry on the 9th of July to be at Ishnuk at 11 uh, in fact I want to be there at half past 10 I'll be leaving home here at around 9am in the morning so anyway that's all you need to do is uh, purchase any uh, book or uh, on Gubba creation on the Mythical Ireland website at www.mythicalireland.com and you will be automatically entered into a draw uh, for this item. And uh, this the draw will be made on the Hill of Ishnuk on the 9th of July. But as I said, you do not have to be in attendance at the Hill of Ishnuk uh, to be in with a chance of winning. Uh, yet another wonderful piece uh, inspired by the recent decision uh, last week, I think, I changed the cover photo on the Mythical Ireland community uh, group on Facebook. Uh, and uh, the new photo shows uh, one of my photographs of Curbstone 67. And if you look at that photograph, you'll see that indeed there's a single lozenge above the conjoined spirals and a double lozenge, uh, nested lozenges as it were, a lozenge within a lozenge be below, a beautiful recreation of a magnificent piece of megalithic art. From 5,000 years ago. What more need I say? Anyway, uh, if I haven't, uh, Catherine Woodruff is in the house. Hello, Catherine. Uh, Katie Brogan, not sure if I said hello to you already, but hello anyway. Strange Land is in Newfoundland, Canada. A very good afternoon uh, to you. Lots of lovely comments about Tom's work. And sure, look, isn't he just super? Uh, <laughs> there's a good example there, Tom. Holy Lord, unreal. <laughs> Yeah, gorgeous work as always, uh, says Nicolene. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. Yes, 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 yes. Huge, huge amount of comments. So there you go. Strangeland, I have family roots in Ireland, Murphy and White. Fascinating. I'm a Murphy, <laughs> but we are the most, the Murphy is the most common place surname in Ireland. So, you know, it, it is a uh, Murphy and, and Kelly and O'Sullivan and a few others, uh, Brennan and uh up there in the top 10 murphy being the top anyway i will get on with the reading we last week were reading from uh sylvester o'halloran's uh, history of ireland uh which i think i said was published in 1778 which i think last week i said was a decade before 
1798 rebellion. But in fact, no, Anthony, it's two decades. It's definitely 20 years. Uh, it was just after the broadcast had finished last week. I realized my maths weren't that good. <laughs> I tell you, you wouldn't want me totting up your sums, that's for sure. And so this evening we are carrying on with Sylvester O'Halloran's uh, history uh, from chapter five, because we read up as far as chapter four yesterday. Coda is out in the yard, basking in the evening sunshine, chasing flies around the garden. And uh, if he gets too raucous, we shall let him in uh, and uh, see see how we get on. Anyway, if everybody is comfortable, I hope you have your your dram or your brew. <laughs> Most people are probably having a brew, but I mean, if it's a whiskey or something like that, or a Chardonnay uh, and or whatever you happen having, uh, you know, feel free. Uh, this one, this uh, chapter is called. Uh, it's not called anything. It's called Chapter V. <laughs> Remarks on the preceding relations. Source of historical systems. Early migrations. Emigrations even. Conducted not by land, but by water. Supported by the authorities of Moses, Joseph, uh, Josephus, and of Tacitus, etc. The preceding relations extracted, as we have seen, from the most respectable pieces of Irish antiquities have been strangely and unaccountably commented on, not only by foreigners, but even by some of our modern domestic writers. And this detail in itself, so capable of illustrating the early periods of Irish and British history, as we shall show, has only supplied them with pretenses and arguments to weaken the authority of the subsequent parts of our history. For, they say, if tales such as these are to be obtruded upon us for history, what can we suppose the re remainder to be but a jusdem farine, which I believe is French, and that means of the same flower, meaning the same kind, same kind of stories. But the Milesian, Ir Milesian Irish transmitted them to posterity on the faith of the people they subdued, and for the authenticity of which they could be in no way responsible. To bring our annals into disrepute, they should attack those parts which relate to the exploits of our Milesian ancestors only, not those which they could have no hand in. Nor have they had candor enough to acknowledge the generous and liberal principles displayed by them on this occasion, who, contrary to the barbarous principles of most other conquerors, ancient as well as modern, Instead of destroying every evidence which might reflect honour on the legislation and politics of the people they subdued, carefully transmitted them to posterity. Had the old Romans acted on such noble principles, what funds of knowledge, it does say funds, I'd imagine you're trying to say what founts, what funds of knowledge and erudition should we now be possessed of? What he's saying here is that the preceding mythology pertaining to the two of the Danon survived uh, and that it was not obliterated uh, after the Milesians came, uh, something that the Romans couldn't uh, uh, boast about. And we are so glad here in Ireland that the Romans never conquered us. Who knows what might have been lost in terms of mythology. And a message there through Mandy, Joan, sends her love and thanks to Anthony and all the two. And we are indeed uh, thinking of Joan at this, what must be a very difficult time for her. To minds open to conviction, a stronger proof of the civilization of our early ancestors could not be offered, nor of the wisdom and extensiveness of their plan of government. The moment they found the ancient inhabitants of the country unable to injure them, that moment they ceased to consider them as enemies and they only studied how to make them useful members of society. Unlike our modern legislators, they labored not to destroy and discredit their antiquities as if no glory could arise from the conquest of a brave and polished people. They, on the contrary, transmitted to posterity the genealogies, the exploits and the principal actions of these people. But let us now consider how far these accounts may be supported and 
fabulous as they have been represented, uh, what lights they may not be capable of throwing on early history, and particularly on that of Britain. That spirit of Pyrrhonism, which the Reformation introduced, was not confined simply to religion. It affected the sciences. Men now accustomed to think for themselves saw how genius was shackled by the subtleties of the schools and philosophical inquiries obstructed by too implicit adherence to ancient dogmas. Had they confined their doubts within proper bounds, mankind would undoubtedly be the better and wiser for their inquiries. But certain barriers, as well in religion as in government, when once broken through, the future limits of either cannot afterwards be easily circumscribed. Oh my God, apologies. In this general rage of reformation, it appears to me that history suffered not a little since the authorities of ancient historians were as much called in question as those of ancient divines and philosophers. Thus, instead of adhering to the relations of remote analysts, the moderns have freely contradicted them in many instances and have opposed specious modern arguments to invalidate ancient facts. The strongest and most dangerous instance of this innovation is the present acknowledged system of population, which at once destroys the credit of ancient history. Population, says modern historic hypothesis, originating from the East, countries must receive inhabitants in proportion to their proximity to this great reservoir only. Continents must necessarily be inhabited before islands, and these last in proportion to their vicinity to those continents. Oh, crikey. Anthony, don't worry, you only have to last another three quarters of an hour. It'll be grand, honestly. And the window's open here. Um, need coffee. Thus, Britain must be peopled after Gaul, the northern parts from the south, uh, and from both and after both Ireland, as neither North or South Britain furnish any traces of history before the Roman invasion. Fascinating. That's total nonsense. Ireland must, this is the late 1700s when we didn't know a lot of what we know now. Ireland must, of course, be involved in the same barbarous chaos in spite of every evidence to the contrary. Exclamation mark. But for the sake of truth and to endeavour to restore to history part of that dignity which conjecture has robbed it of, <coughs> let us examine on what foundations in reason and truth this curious hypothesis is supported. Moses tells us that by the posterity of Japheth, the isles of the Gentiles were divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Unquote. Now, all the interpreters are unanimous that the Isles of the Gentiles mean those of Europe. And to such as may dispute the divine authority of this legislator, I shall observe that on this occasion I shall introduce him as an historian only, recording a well known fact in and before his days. And a more respectable one, antiquity cannot surely produce. Here then, to demonstration, we see the European islands inhabited by different people and speaking different languages long before the year of the world 2453, at which time Moses conducted the Israelites out of Egypt. He even shows, contrary to modern visionaries, that the separation of these different sects did not proceed from too great an increase of inhabitants, because it happened at so early a period after the flood, i.e. in the days of Phalag, that it could not possibly be the case. <laughs> He's taken it as read that the uh, biblical account of the flood and Noah and all of that is uh, uh, accurate recorded history. Immediately after the flood, Noah is commanded. Yes, this is a 1778 publication. Tom Lawler says... That's how I feel. I could sleep for a week, lol. <laughs> yeah, I could certainly sleep, I think, for 12 hours, definitely. 
Uh, immediately after the flood, Noah is commanded to be fruitful, to multiply, and to replenish the earth. The moment the confusion of languages began, that moment did they begin to scatter and disperse over the face of all the earth. Though we should not even allow inspiration to this writer, yet, excuse me, oh. can somebody else take over? <laughs> yet as philosophers, we surely must agree that a better reason could not be assigned for the dispersion of mankind than diversities of languages. The earlier we admit of the difference in tongues, the earlier we must acknowledge the necessity of mankind separating. Could this be effected easier by land than by water? It undoubtedly could not. Immense woods must be cut through, rivers passed, and still greater dangers from the unknown tracts apprehended. How would women and children, subsistence, etc., be conveyed? But what space of time would it not take to fill the continent without noticing islands? And yet it is evidence that these last were peopled before it was possible for the continent to be overstocked, if ever it was, which I much doubt. Uh, somebody might help Barbara Murphy, who's watching on a new tablet. Uh, she's seeing a larger picture, but can't see the comments. Um, and Barbara is watching on Facebook. So maybe somebody might be able to help her uh, in the comments there. We know that for three and four centuries past, European colonies have emigrated to different parts of the globe, that these settlements have been affected by ships, and that in all these instances, a redundancy of inhabitants was never pleaded as a pretense. Curiosity, interest, or convenience stimulated the first people, and their success encouraged other adventurers. But besides the evidences of Moses and of reason, we have others to differ in defense of truth and antiquity. Josephus is positive, or is it Josephus, that the posterity of Noah passed by sea to many places, and indeed, it were hard to say how else they could be conveyed. It's amazing, isn't it, in the space of a couple of centuries or a little bit more, a um, couple of two and a half centuries nearly, how much we've come on in terms of what we know about the past and how little we actually rely, uh, if at all, on biblical accounts, which at certain times in the past were taken as uh, absolute uh, records. Tacitus is so clear in the necessity of marine emigrations that he gives us a reason why the natives of Germany must have been Aborigines of that country and the continent too. Apologies. Momentary skip. Apologies. Give me one moment. I just need to find my place because I skipped over a page there. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Tacitus is so clear in the necessity of marine emigrations that he gives as a reason why the natives of Germany must have been Aborigines of that country and the continent too. Impossibility of early navigators venturing into so tempestuous and swelling a sea. For, says he, the first settlers travelled not by land but went in fleets. Must we not grant that they had better opportunities of information than we modern speculists so very many ages after them? The ancients less preoccupied with absurd opinions of lazy philosophers than the moderns gave free scope to clear sense and reason. Maybe reading this is putting me to sleep. I don't know. The facility of conveying themselves from place to place by means of water must have struck the most ignorant people from the bare floating of timber. The spreading of their clothes must have pointed out to them the means and advantages of collecting wind. And a very little experience must have shown them how to weather points and double capes and headlands. We know from remotest antiquity that the poor on the sea coasts of most countries used boats made of wicker baskets covered with cow skins, the curragh still made in the Boyne Valley, in which they braved the most tempestuous seas, and such are at this day successfully used in the west of the county of Clare. If then 
poor and uninformed people incapable of procuring better materials have performed voyages and successfully crossed the seas in such wretched vehicles what might not be affected by persons of more refined sense and extensive power and i think here he's definitely arguing uh, in favor of um our good friend Bob Quinn, who said that we had sailed the oceans long before we saddled a horse. Desiree Riley is in the house. Had to let the puppies in. <laughs> they heard Anthony Murphy and started to howl <laughs> to come inside and listen. <laughs> uh, brilliant. Uh, Coda is out in the yard, but that may not last too long. He'll probably get restless after a few minutes and start barking. Tarini Pendleton is watching from Laguna Beach, California. Good evening to you. Giant Oak, Banakti, Tufain. You're very welcome. I'm just checking that I'm not missing anyone. Sophie O'Neill says, Midnight sun here in Reykjavik. Sleep is well and truly a thing of the past. <laughs> Blackout blinds and curtains uh, badly needed there, I'd say. Uh, brilliant. Okay, I'll continue. I'm not sure I'm seeing any anyone that I missed other than those that I've mentioned. Whether the early ancients understood the use of the compass in sailing, I shall not inquire though confidently affirmed by some moderns, and that this, with the purple dye of the Tyrians, the malleability of glass, etc., were afterwards lost. Nothing, however, can be fuller than the proofs they offer of sea expeditions. Witness the Phoenician commerce. Witness the mighty fleets of the e Egyptian Sesostris, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, whom chronologists have placed earlier, by near three centuries, than the taking of Troy. One of these armaments, antiquity affirms, sailed through the Straits of Babel Mandel from the Arabian Gulf to India and, doubling the Cape of Good Hope, returned through the Straits' mouth and the Mediterranean Sea. We see long before the days of Homer, the European islands well known to the Greeks, how else could he introduce Ireland into the Odyssey, as we see he has, and determine its distance to be about 10 days sail from the Straits. In the days of Solomon, voyages to India were frequent, and we find it took three years. If then the ancients knew not, pardon me, I'm terribly sorry, I can't stop it. If the ancients knew not the use of the compass, they certainly must of some other instrument equally useful besides the polar stars at night and the sun in the day, all which collected must have given an air not only of possibility, but of probability to the foregoing relations. What this represents really is a piece of late 18th century speculation. But beside the above proofs, <laughs> I don't think he offered any proof really, plain sense and reason should point out to us the dangers attending on modern hypothesis in history. Quote, in many instances, says Bale, B-A-Y-L-E, historical truths are not less impenetrable than physical ones. Unquote. Because we cannot satisfactorily explain many phenomena in nature, must it follow that the facts are also to be rejected? What avails is that, in considering the days of old, the years of many generations, Moses recommends us to, quote, inquire of our fathers, and they will tell us, to consult, consult our elders, and they will show us, unquote. Or that Cicero should declare that, quote, history is the witness of times past, the height of truth, the life of memory, the guide of life, the herald of antiquity, unquote. Behold, Modern visionaries oppose their lazy, indigested reveries to the evidence of antiquity. And if anything can more fully justify the necessity of these remarks, it is the attempts lately, by, lately made by the two Macphersons. These men have laboured to establish a system of Scottish history, contrary to the voice of antiquity and even to the evidence of modern times and of two distinct people at this day speaking different languages and till about 30 years ago governed by different laws to make from all antiquity but one nation i mean the picts and scots thus encouraged by the success of modern historical theorists they have boldly thrown off every restraint and even the appearance 
of respect to ancient facts. Though affirmed by so respectable a writer as the Venerable Bede, and of facts he speaks to from his own knowledge. This is chapter six. Just check the comments. There is a Christopher in the house. Who is the Christopher who's joined us? Uh, let me just check. Have I said hello already? Maybe I have. Uh, Christopher, whoever you are, hello, 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 and welcome. I do not know who that is. Mandy is saying hello. Chapter 6. When Caesar tells us that the Celtic arts, religion and letters originated in the British Isles, or rather in Ireland, and that even in his own days, such on the continent as chose to excel in them, repaired directly to us, to deny such people the early use of history must be wholly absurd. Annals the Britons must have undoubtedly had in his days, as well as the Gauls, though Caesar is silent on this head without, sorry, on this head with respect to both. It cannot be denied but that the Roman policy was, while they introduced their laws and customs among the people they subdued, they at the same time laboured to destroy every vestige of the former state of such people, so that Absorbed in veneration at the power of their conquerors, they forgot their own abject state. The earliest writer of British history on record is Nennius, an author of the 7th century. His work I have not seen, but it is agreed upon that from it, Geoffrey, Archdeacon of Monmouth, a Benedictine monk, and afterward Bishop of St. Asaph in the 12th century, took the principal materials for his history of Britain. And yet this work, fabulous as it has been deemed when compared with the preceding relations, will show that the Britons retained some faint traditional memory of their real origin. But like the Scots in the reign of the first Edward, when they attempted the outlines of their history, so deformed it with absurdities and anachronisms as to make it appear rather a romance than a history. It is the peculiar glory of Irish history to be able with precision to illustrate the history and chronology of other nations. In this chapter we shall confine our inquiries to that of Britain. In other words, how the Irish chronicled English history, the British history. In the next book we shall show what the Greeks and Egyptians, etc., owe to our ancestors. And these annals, which Hume and others of his stamp have so infamously misrepresented, far from appearing a heap of indigested falsehoods, will, I trust, be acknowledged as the cornerstone of true history and true chronology. Geoffrey tells us that Brutus, who first landed in Britain, was obliged to fly his country for parricide, it says. Should that be patricide? Impatient to succeed his father before his time. And our annals inform us that Partholan fled from Greece to Ireland for a similar crime. He says, from this Brutus, Britain took its name. And our antiquarians are unanimous that it was so called from Brit Britain, B-R-I-O-T-A-N, the son of Fergus. Henry of Huntington fixes the arrival of the Britons in England to be in the third age of the world and that of the Scots in Ireland in the fourth. We have seen that Britain fled thither from Ireland, AM Anno Mundi 2380, and that the Scots landed here, Anno Mundi or Mundi at 2736. Geoffrey says that Brutus landed, I presume this is Geoffrey of Monmouth, the aforementioned uh, Benedictine. Uh, Geoffrey says that Brutus landed in Cornwall about 1200 years after the flood, but our analysts, as we have seen, have fixed the landing of Britain at a much earlier period. But the two Adidanans, or Damnoni, certainly landed there from Ireland and about the period he assigns. The earliest name of Britain was Albion, and to prove it not a Greek but a radical Irish word, 
It was so called from Elia, E I L E, another, and Ban, Ban, an old name for Ireland and Scotland. I wonder is that any relation to Bamba? And Scotland to this day has, in Irish, no other name. It is pretty remarkable that British writers agree that England and Ireland were peopled by the same race of men. And in the days of the Romans, Tacitus declares their customs and manners very similar. Caesar says that the Britons wore long hair and had their beards shaved, except the upper lip. These customs were continued in Ireland till lately. The hair was called glib and the whisker cronbial. British, uh, well, I presume that's crone bale, bale for mouth. British writers from conjecture and hypothesis affirm Britain to be the mother country. But Irish writers from the earliest records confirmed by facts declare Ireland to be the great hive. Just put that in your pipe and smoke it. Chlwyd, the best informed antiquarian in Britain, and the most proper judge of the matter, because a master of the old Irish as well as the old British language confesses, quote, that the most ancient names of places, rivers, mountains, and we may add of cities too, in Britain are pure Irish, that both the Welsh and Cornish are replete with Irish, nay, that they are nearly of the same genus and that part of many of their compound words are pure Irish. To account for these facts, he has informed an hypothesis, for as such only he offers it, finding the Irish called, uh, well, he has it here spelt Gadelians, uh, the Gael, basically, as well as Scots. He presumes the Gaelians were a branch of the ancient Celtae, inhabitants of Britain, and who retired to Ireland to make way for new invaders. And that the names of these places, such as they found them, these last retained. But though this may be received with regard to the names of the places, yet it will never explain why these new settlers should retain in their tongue so much of the Irish language. Besides, Mr. Floyd, in the dedication of his Welsh dictionary to his countrymen, strongly recommends to them the study of the Irish language and history. He even affirms that, quote, that it is clear that the Irish language is absolutely necessary to those who would write of the Isle of Britain, unquote. Fascinating stuff, I think you'll agree. He has not once asserted that the British is a necessary help to investigate the antiquities of Ireland. In other words, the opposite way around. He also declares, quote, that he could have no reason to doubt but that the Galeans, the Irish, had formerly lived all over this kingdom, unquote. The very learned Bishop of Cloyne embraces this hypothesis of Cloyd, and he even attempts to demonstrate mathematically the time of the emigration of the Galeans to Ireland from the difference in language between the old Britons and Irish. Thus, the Highland Scots became a distinct people from Ireland, the mother country, suppose a thousand years ago, though the emigrations began much earlier. And if we grant that the affinity of the Highland Erse with the Irish language be in the ratio of three to one with the affinity of uh, between the Welsh and the Irish, then the quantity of time elapsed since the separation of the Welsh and Irish should be in the inverse ratio of three to one with the former, so that fixing at a medium, at a medium, the separation of the Highlanders from the Irish at 1000 years, that of the Welsh from the Irish must be at 3000 years, which approaches very near the time pointed out by our historians for the first invasion of Britain. But besides the close affinity in languages between the old British and old Irish, their customs, manners, and inclinations seem to indicate them originally one people. Uh, 
Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, thank you, folks, for uh, reporting and blocking uh, the clown. Which I can't do from within uh, the streaming app, but I think you've all dealt with it. So thank you for that. Um, Miriam is in the house. Hello, Miriam. <laughs> uh, Irish technical thinker is saying that people in Belfast still look as the Romans described. <laughs> uh, who am I missing? There's a big long comment there that I missed from uh, Desiree. The stars and constellations seem to spiral around the pole star. Both the sun and moon appear spiral in their path across the sky when mapped throughout their respective cycles. We don't observe the heavens as patiently or intensively as the ancients, but there are lovely still photo overlays on internet that illustrate these spirals that the ancients witnessed by rigorous studying of the night skies, something I believe they did because they were tracking migratory and plan, planning, planting cycles like uh, man, present day hunter gatherers do. A very good point. And indeed the spiral representing the winding of the sun down from summer to winter and back from winter to summer uh, has been pointed out uh, by various researchers, myself included, something I really like. Uh, Geoglitch indeed. Uh, Miriam, good to see you. I hope you're in good form. The Welsh, like the Irish, are brave, humane and hospitable, glorying in the nobleness of their ancestry and great lovers of music and poetry. Their ancient form of government was, according to the Irish modus, and to us their bards and musicians repaired for instruction, hence that elegant alliteration in their poetry, and hence that softness and harmony in their music, and their particular attachment to the harp. Mr. Wharton tells us that, so late as the 11th century, quote, the Welsh bards received their instructions in Ireland, and brought with them to Wales, diverse cunning musicians who devised in a manner all the instrumental music that is now used there as appeareth as well by the books written of the same as also of the tunes and measures used among them to this day and there's coda uh desire i'm not sure if you're if your hounds are able to hear him here then is every reasonable evidence that can be demanded that the old british and old irish were from one common stock. The difficulty lies which to determine to be the parent country. The best informed Britons assert from conjecture only that it is Britain, but to this many objections can be made. According to their theory, the Galeans giving way to new invaders from Gaul at length retired to Ireland, but did these invaders also speak the Irish language? If they did, then must the first European settlers have had a language in common, which, though asserted, no man of sense, at least none but a hypothetical historian, should credit. Again, if Britain was the parent country, how came it so much inferior to Ireland in rank and power in these early as well as in subsequent times? In the days of Caesar, Ireland was well known to the Romans, and in those of Domitian, we find it the very soul of the British confederacies. Tacitus likewise confesses it much better known for commerce, and in the subsequent periods, till the dereliction of Britain by the Romans, it is well known that Irish was the primum mobile of the attempts to expel Romans from that country. In the days their Romans, in the days of Christianity, they supported the same preeminence. At the Council, Council of Constance, AD fourteen seventeen, the English were not allowed to vote as a nation. The canonists there being clear that they were included in the nation of Germany, as they were not governed by their own princes, but subdued by Germans who were themselves tributary to the emperor. But they, setting forth that their king was also monarch of Ireland, which kingdom always held the third rank among the nations of Europe, these ecclesiastics on this account were decreed to precede those of France, thus opposing argument to argument, though we should not call in the aid of history. It must be admitted that, from plain reason, 
we must recur to Irish history to elucidate the early periods of that of Britain. Some people saying hello to Coda. Yes, he is finally making himself heard. However, the Milesian Irish might be imposed on in the relations of the first invaders of Ireland. They could not certainly... Sorry. However, the Milesian Irish might be imposed on in the relations of the first invaders of Ireland, they could not certainly be with respect to the people they themselves subdued. The Damnoni... I don't know why he calls them that. The Damons, whom they subdued, had long governed the kingdom and the Belgae, though greatly depressed, but still numerous and powerful, actually aided these invaders. From their own knowledge of both people, our Shanachis have assured us that they had a language in common with the Milesians and were descended from one common stock, all deriving their pedigree through Magog and Japheth. I mean, this is all trying to link in with the Bible. The Milesians being descended from Bath, eldest son of Magog, and all the preceding colonies from Fathokta, his third son, that their language was the same, not only the voice of antiquity, but even of modern times, declares. Dr. Cray, Archbishop of Armagh, who was confined for his religion in the Tower of London, where he died in AD 1587, in his Irish grammar, affirms, quote, that the Irish language was the only one spoke by the natives from the coming of Partholon 300 years after the flood to this day, unquote. O'Sullivan, who figured about the same time, asserts the same. Dr. Keating and Grat Lucius are equally positive. He's talking about, uh, is he talking about uh, uh, Je Geoffrey Keating and the history of Ireland? Dr. Keating and Grat Lucius are equally positive, and O'Flaherty admits that it has been always a received opinion. Uh, and the rest is in uh, Latin. Harum quatur colonierum duces cum milicis de contur agnovis patrem magog no noachi ex japetho nepotem et linguam scoticam omnibus in usu fuis that looks like a french word fuis f-u-i-s-s-e as you can clearly tell i've never studied latin they are equally positive that the first invaders of britain were the followers of britain b-r-i-o-t-a-n surnamed the bald britain the bald and that from this is that is he related to citric the squinty and that from this prince the country assumed the name of Britain as the people did that of Britons. And since they must have, excuse me, originated from some colony, where can they trace a more honourable source? Thus a very ancient chronological poem, beginning with uh, a furious assault or chashel, informs us, quote, that Neved and his children landed in the lovely island of Ireland and from him and that from him the Fir Vulugs and the Tuatadanans are descended, unquote. Thus he sings. Tanya Nevach Gona Chwin Alfi Inish Ard Ilvin Nas Nata Dogain Tuade August Fir Vulug Ahenchre, but he doesn't give a translation. It could not be vanity that made Irish writers assert that Britain led a colony of Nemedian, a colony even, of Nemedian Irish into Albion, since the Picts, who were a more numerous and warlike people, and to whom our ancestors also assigned settlements in Britain, are confessed by them to be a colony of strangers. Bethany Cutler has joined us. Aaron O'Leary is in the house. A very good evening to you all. I hope you are in good form. But as the duty of an historian is to investigate truth above all things and to conceal from his readers nothing that may help to disguise or render facts doubtful, I must acknowledge that the Venerable Bede asserts that the early Britons came from Brittany 
and that from them Britain took its name. This is undoubtedly a mistake, but one he may well be excused for. The Britons and Saxons were in a continual state of warfare, so much so that he complains that the hatred of the former to the Saxon name was such that though they were themselves early Christians, yet they refused to send missionaries or take the least pains to instruct them in the faith. Hence, they had recourse to the Irish Scots for teachers and preachers, this being himself confessed to be, sorry, this being by himself confessed to be the case, we may presume that Bede gave himself little trouble about British antiquities and took his account from hearsay. For nothing is more certain than that the ancient native name of Brittany was Leta, Letania or Letavia, nor was it even very long before the days of Bede that it was changed for that of Brittany, being so called from the invasion of a uh, Conan Bertrand Dargentry, Dar Dar a celebrated civilian of the 16th century, is positive that it was so called from the clearest, clearest evidence, and Mesere is certain that it retained that name in the fourth, and we can prove that it was so called in the fifth century. Saint Fiac. F-I-E-C-H, Bishop of Slepti, and among the first of St. Patrick's converts in his life of this apostle in 34 stanzas, tells Ran the Fifth, uh, which uh, in, in Irish, which in English translates as Patrick having passed over all Albion, for Alpa is here understood in that right, not for the Alps, crossed the sea happily and remained with Germanus, in the southern parts of Latania. Here is a further proof of what French writers have affirmed, and it at the same time shows the antiquity and authenticity of that poem. I hope you're all staying awake. Fergal Canton has slipped quietly into the room at the back. <laughs> yeah, always do that without announcing it. <laughs> and you're less likely to be noticed by the scowling schoolmaster. Anyway, Gordon Farrell is in the house. Hello, Gordon. How are things in the county of Longford? A fabulous part of the world. And this is chapter seven. Uh, and I think this will be the final chapter of tonight's reading, uh, mainly on account of the fact that I can't concentrate. <laughs> and therefore, I'm struggling to see how you guys are possibly keeping up. Um, I hope that I've rendered the pronunciation the fact that I can't concentrate. <laughs> and therefore, I'm struggling to see how you guys are. There's another me! Um, he has appeared on the I screen over there the talking. The fact that I can't concentrate. I'm just going to listen to him instead. And therefore, yeah. I'm struggling to see how you guys are. There's another me! <laughs> um, he has appeared on the screen over there talking. I don't know how that happened. It's a bit of a phantom. I'm just going to listen to him instead. And therefore, I'm struggling to see how you guys are. There's another me! I apologize <laughs> for that intermission. <laughs> Britain Mail, the son of Fergus, son of Nevid, a descendant of Magog. Of course, this difficulty of trying to always link the lineages of the early inhabitants uh, with biblical characters, which, uh, you know, earlier writers took as fact and, and took as Bible, uh, which are now not just disputed, but now known to be absolute nonsense. So bear with me, uh, or bear with him, shall I say, Mr. Uh, uh, Sylvester O'Halloran. Uh, Britain Mail, son of Fergus, son of Nevid, a descendant of Magog, by his son Fathokta, retired from Ireland to North Britain from the rage of the Africans about Anno Mundi 2380. And as his posterity increased, they extended more to the southward. Of this colony, our annals furnish no other accounts but that they were the Aborigines of Britain, that from their leader the country took its name, and that they spoke the Scythian or Irish language. 
Scythian or Irish language. Well, which is it? Are they or were they both similar? From the Welsh or Old Britons being called in their native language Kimri, K I M or I, which I presume gives rise to the the Welsh uh, uh, Kimri. The authors, and I've probably mispronounced that. Apologies, uh, Mavanwi, and all of the Welsh viewers. The authors of the Universal History suppose that the, from the sorry suppose them the posterity of Gomer. Macpherson derives them from the Kimri of Germany, and Mr. Whitaker brings them from the Kimri of Gaul. All these conjectures proceed from an ignorance of the Irish history and the Irish language. I've seen a consistent theme here, which is that uh, to understand the history of the Britons, uh, the British peoples, you have to know the history of the Irish and the Irish language. The posterity of Britain when they settled in Wales, called themselves Kimri, and inhabiting a country full of hills and valleys, from the Irish Kumar or Kuvar, a valley, hence Kuvarek, the inhabitants of a country full of hills and dales, and which a district in the country, uh, in the county, should I say, of Waterford, still retains. And to prove more fully the truth of this derivation, the Brigantes, another colony from Ireland, which emigrated near 400 years later than the Britons, and who first inhabited Cumberland, and from thence extended themselves by degrees into Durham, York, Westmoreland, etc., were also called Kimry from their first settlement. The next colony of the Britons, the next colony to the Britons, came the Fervolugs or the Belgae. Numbers of these we see retired to Britain from the tyranny of the Damnonni, the De Danans of Ireland, from the year of the world 2541 to 2580. These also spoke the Irish language and appear to have been an intrepid race of men, having made some noble efforts to recover their country from these new invaders. Macpherson transports them from Gaul, and so does Whitaker. They possessed themselves of Kent, Middlesex, and extended to Hampshire and Wiltshire, etc. A considerable number of the Damnoni, or Tua de Danans, in their turn, felt also the force of power and oppression. Unable to resist the superior power and discipline of the Scottish invaders, or Milesians, such of them as could not stoop to servitude or acknowledge new masters, retired also to Britain, or more properly, had settlements appointed for them there by the victors, as we see they bestowed soon after others on their tributaries, the Picts, and on their relations, the Brigantes. These Damnani occupied Cornwall, Devonshire, and the places adjacent, and this colony began to get existence in Britain around Anno Mundi 2736, and greatly increased afterwards. In fine, the Brigantes, or Clanna Brogan, began to get footing there a very few years after. Mr. Whitaker supposes the Aborigines of Britain and the Belgae to be the only principal colonies of that island, and that they were afterwards indiscriminately called Kimbri, Gael, Welsh, Brigantes, Caledones, etc. He supposes them called Kimbri, C-I-M-B-R-I, to denote their source from those of the continent, and the country Britain importing their importing their being importing their being separated oh, that makes sense of that sentence importing their being separated from their brethren there crikey uh, maybe somebody can make sense of that but i can't derivations extremely stretched and far-fetched brigantes comes under the same exp explanation from caledones imports such of them as lived in a woody country Far from censuring on this occasion, I highly honour Mr. Whitaker's ingenious attempts to illustrate the ancient history of his country. Destitute of proper materials, indeed of any materials, but the names of these different colonies. Where could he seek for information but from the accounts of nations of corresponding names on the continent? These he has happily introduced and made as much of the subject as, in a case so obscure, could well could be well made. How could it be otherwise? Britain, a theatre of war between the Romans, Irish and Picts, 
for above four centuries, involved in great misery through the tyranny of the Saxons and after them of the Danes and Normans, could the more refined works of peace be attended to in such scenes of distress and confusion? We see similar causes produce like effects with regard to the Albanian Irish, who not only lost those records which they possessed at and after the days of the Venerable Bede, but even through disuse, the very letter of the language. So that in an after period, i.e. about the reign of Edward I, when a knowledge of history appeared ne necessary to them to support their independence and letters began to revive, they adopted the Roman instead of the Irish alphabet. Similar to this is the case of the Irish at this day. In the last century, the English tongue was confined to a narrow space. And though many of our great men spoke it, yet, like the French and Italian, it was acquired. Very few understood and studied their native language, and the quantity of vellum manuscripts, which was cut up and destroyed afterwards, was amazing. In a word, 30 or 40 years ago, there were many schools for the Irish language, but at this day it is little attended to. And, what is more extraordinary, very few even of our gentry now know, or pretend to know, anything of their native history. All British antiquarians from Camden, Lloyd, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, Cloyd, and Rowland, or Rowland, to Whitaker, and, shall I class him among such respectable names, Macpherson, however, are unanimous that the British colonists spoke the same language in the name, though differing in many things. The British and Cornish, Mr. Cloyd, shows come nearer to each other than to the Irish. The British of the Brigantes of Cumberland, he observed, is much nearer the native Irish. And that of the Albanian Scots is known at this day to be a dialect of the Irish, as is that of the inhabitants of the Isle of Man. Now, all these variations serve but as additional proofs of the truth of our records. Though both British and Irish are the descendants of Magog, stated as absolute fact, <laughs> yet we see an early separation in the issue of his sons. The Nemedian Irish must have differed from that of the Belgae. A separation of 117 years must produce some difference in the language. The Damnoni were for 155 years cut off from any intercourse with their Irish brethren. And of course, the difference was greater. <clears throat> if a well-bred Englishman should go to the barony of Fort in the county of Wexford, he would with difficulty understand the English spoken there, which is the very same as spoken by the English colony first planted there in the days of Henry II. That the language of the Brigantes should approach still nearer the Irish cannot be wondered at. They were, as we will observe in its place, of the same blood with the sons of Milesius, being all great grandsons of Brogan, and for that reason called by our antiquarians Clanabrogan to distinguish their issue from those of the Clanamila or the sons of Milesius. These, it will appear, highly polished their language and being separated from their ancestors of the line of Fathokta at a very early period, of course, the greater the difference in dialect. In fine, the language of the Albanian Irish is, at this day, almost the same with the mother tongue. Though I would not wish or pretend to form an historical basis on the derivation of words, howsoever well-founded, yet as auxiliaries to history, I think them, I think them in many instances uh, admissible. The Britons, the Belgae, the Damnoni, the Brigantes, we find, were different British colonies, though from the same source, and their names, I hope, have fairly uh, I have fairly and naturally accounted for. The Caledones were a very different people from all these and spoke a different language. Venerable Bede informs us that in his time, the languages of South Britain were the British and the Saxon. We see, though, the Britons were of different tribes, yet he confesses their language the same. But he is positive that the Picts or Caledones had a language of their own. He could not be deceived. He was on their borders and intimately acquainted with some of their most eminent people. 
How could moderns get over this assertion or make them and the Britons one people? Here again, the utility of Irish history becomes conspicuous. These people, as Bede testifies, landed in Ireland soon after its conquest by the sons of Milesius. They were called Picts from painting their bodies and Caledones from Cahluan, the son of Gud, who was their leader to North Britain. For Cahluan is with us pronounced Caluan, and Don is used to denote the posterity of any person. Thus, Caledon, the explanation of which has caused so much trouble and given rise to such various conjectures, implies no more than the posterity of, of Caluan. Even the names of places and people in Roman Britain show their Irish origin. Thank you, Coda. I shall not take any trouble to refute those of Whitaker and Macpherson, because I know of no language that can justify them. One part of this people, the Romans called Silures, from Siol, the issue, and Era, Ireland, as glorying more and perhaps being closer connected with the mother country than the rest. The people in and about Kent, they called Canti, C-A-N-T-I-I. It is evident that in the native British, however, they must have been called Cantiri, C-A-N-T-I-R-I, because the capital of Kent is still called Canterbury. Cantira is Irish for headland, and such was the name they gave to a similar headland in Scotland. Some were denominated Trinobantes from Trian, Hero, and Oban, Sudden. I suppose these were a set of warriors, as we know in Ireland, certain counties were better known for soldiers than others. The Durotrige inhabited the sea coasts from Dur, Water, and Trade, a quarrel, I suppose pirates are powerful at sea. Doboni, D-O-B-U-N-I, such as lived in low situations from Dolain, Deep, Hollow, for it is to be noticed that B and N are the in the Irish, sometimes substituted for each other, and that with an auxiliary H, both carry the same sound. Cape Cornwall was called Belerium from Bale, uh, sorry, and Bale is Irish for a mouth, and Era, Ireland, being the place where the first fugitive Damnani landed. That's interesting. He's saying that Belerium means the mouth of Ireland. The inhabitants of South Wales were called Dimatai, Dimtu implies or div to protection and ah just the ord of ordovis ordoviches or ord oh, I can't really can't even pronounce it and given up I don't think I'll be reading much more of this <laughs> the ordovices from ord lofty and Aw, avas a soldier ord of ordovices ordovices or the warriors of the hills the Isle of Man was so called from Man, Man Manon who we see first opened a trade to it from Ireland. Thus the different British tribes, the Picts accepted, were to demonstration, not Celtic, but Scythian colonies, not the descendants of Gomer, but of Magog, but that the smallest doubt should not remain in an affair so important to British antiquities. Cloyd himself shall be my testimony. Quote, the next thing I have to make out, says he, is that part of the Irish called Galians, have once dwelt in England and Wales. There are none of the Irish that I know of among all their historical writings that mention that they were possessed of England and Wales. And yet, whoever takes notice of the great many of the names of the rivers and mountains throughout the kingdom will find no reason to doubt but the Irish must have been the inhabitants when these names were imposed upon them, or on them, unquote. But Irish writers, we see, have said that colonies from Ireland first inhabited and even gave the name to Britain. They most assuredly held all North Britain under subjection, since we find we shall find them uh, since we shall find them assign it as a settlement to the Picts. That a part of South Britain was so circumstanced, we must conclude from the settling of the Brigantes in Cumberland, etc. To show still further how much consideration and attention should be paid to the preceding records. I shall, by way of closure to this very long chapter, thank God for that, just remind my reader that in the beginning of the fourth chapter, we are told 
that the Danani or the, the Danans resided for some time in Denmark, instructing the people in arts and letters. And in confirmation of this, it is highly, highly remarkable that Wormius declares that the most ancient alphabet used by the northern nations of Europe was called Irlandorum Literae. These nations had also an occult manner of writing described by Celsius when compared with our oem or hierographic character, examples of which may be. All sorts of strange things happening tonight, folks. We've uh, we've had uh, uh, strange interjections by another Anthony, and now we've had a complete um, yes, a failure of the stream. Anyway, I will finish and then finish, and you'll all be saying thank goodness for that. The curious inquirer will be convinced that both the runic and Irish were on the same plan. Add to this that this ohm of the northern nations, like the Irish, had but sixteen letters. The very expression of runic which they gave this species of writing and which name their later writers have not been able to explain is pure irish the word run with us at this day signifies secrecy mystery etc and was justly applicable to this alphabet Yes, that was quite difficult to follow. I hope I'm back again. Oh, yes, and uh, we have, okay. So while we're still streaming, uh, I'm going to try and boot out that pest who's uh, spamming the comments. This time, boot out that uh, another pest. me will appear. Um, give me a second, play just ban that person from the channel. There we go. Oh, that should stop that. Yes, a very strange evening, says Mandy. Yes, indeed. I was tired to start with, and I found uh, O'Halloran to be rambling. It's something about the way uh, English was written in the late 18th century that today it just seems so circuitous, doesn't it? Labyrinthine at times. Just almost as if he's like, will you just get out with what you're saying, man? Can you use half the amount of words that you've actually bloody used? You know, I don't believe it. <laughs> As Victor Meldrew would say, you know. Uh, anyway, um, that is as much of uh, Sylvester O'Halloran as I can take for one day. I might change the subject for next week. Don't forget, by the way, that on the 21st, which is the summer solstice, the longest day of the year. I will be giving a talk for Louth Library Service in Drogheda Library here in my hometown. I'll be giving that talk live to people in person, but it will also be live streamed and recorded uh, afterwards. Uh, when I know the details about where it will be live streamed, I will send you the link so that you can perhaps watch it. Um, and don't forget that our next uh, outing is on the 9th of July and the details of that are scrolling along the ticker on the bottom of the screen as always please do consider becoming a patron of ireland your support is uh, absolutely necessary for the running of things uh, and uh, you get lots of uh, extras that uh, other people don't get if you become a patron a quick word on the uh, curbstone 67 uh, newgrange pendant uh, that uh, this could be yours all you need to do is between now and the 8th of July, the day before the Ishnok tour, is to order uh, one of Tom King's wonderful creations on Go Back Creations on the Mythical Ireland website or one of my books, whichever takes your fancy. And you will be automatically entered into that draw. Somebody's asking for a joke. I was in the shoe store the other day uh, trying on a pair, and I said to the salesman, I was putting one shoe on, I said to the salesman, it's too tight. He told me to try it with the tongue out. I said, it's too tight. <laughs> Oh, terrible. Oh, oh, I expect rotten tomatoes for that one. <laughs> uh, Mavanway, um, can't find anything or move. 
ah, well, look, at least it's done is right. And come here, sure, when you're more settled in, sure, you'll be able to enjoy enjoy it more, you know. Um, do you have a time for the talk? Yes, bear with me for one moment while I check my calendar. I think it's half past six Irish time on the evening of the 21st. I will just double check that. That is Tuesday the 21st. Summer solstice talk, yes, half past six uh, Irish time. So just for the American viewers, uh, that would be minus five, half past 1 p.m. New York and minus eight. Is that half past 10 a.m. on the West Coast? I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. Deborah, you're absolutely right, and I will change next week. I'll definitely do something else next week. Oh my god, that was tough going. Bad enough when you're. Could you could you imagine having to sit through a lecture and, and concentrate on that and take all those notes and names and no, no way. Yvette Tillema, thank you, Yvette, and uh, a very good afternoon to you. Um, yeah, so uh, dad jokes, got to love them. Not sure anybody would agree with that. Maybe they're all hating them. But anyway, um, that is uh, Live Irish Myths for now. Just trying to make sure that I'm not forgetting to mention something else. I didn't know Solov was in the house. Wishing everyone a wonderful day. Uh, Solov, thank you for uh, joining us and uh, good to see you again. Thank you, Mandy tried to put one on the screen and then another one appears uh, Aaron O'Leary thank you as always thank you Aaron lovely name by the way uh, a good night from the Boyne Valley where the sun still hasn't set at this hour 26 minutes past 9 p.m and the sun is still in the sky as to say rapidly heading towards midsummer's day now and the turning of the year all that remains for me to do uh, now is to say Ichawa uh, Kolosov, Slongafol, and most importantly of all, Togabuge. And of course, get your name in the draw for the wonderful Curb 67 pendant. See you all very, very soon.